35 years ago today, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. We now present the people and events that shaped history on this day. Welcome to History Undercover. I'm Arthur Kent. Who killed JFK? Many Americans find the one obvious answer unacceptable, believing Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't have acted alone. In another attempt to clear the air, Congress formed the Assassination Records Review Board, which recently declassified tens of thousands of documents, photos, and film clips. Our program looks at material that had been shrouded in secrecy for decades, there's newly discovered footage of JFK shortly before he was killed, and diary entries from the only man ever put on trial for the murder. Some of the material is tantalizing enough to keep conspiracy buffs busy for decades. Join us as History Undercover presents Missing Files, the JFK Assassination. Washington, D.C. is a city of closely guarded secrets. In the storerooms and vaults of government agencies, there are now so many classified documents, no one is able to give a precise count. Experts estimate that there are more than 150 million classified pages at the CIA alone. It was in the early 1960s, and communism was seen as a threat to democracy. It was a time when powerful government agencies began their dark legacy of secrets and deception. Agencies didn't share information with other agencies. Uh, agencies didn't share information within agencies uh, for fear of compromising the country during a time that uh, was very, very fearful to many people, perhaps more so than it should have been, but it was. It was in this clandestine atmosphere that a president was murdered on November 22nd, 1963. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. A presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man spread eagle over the top of the car. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. Since that day in Dallas, four separate government-sponsored investigations have attempted to answer the question, who killed President John F. Kennedy? From the beginning, their efforts were hampered by a lack of information, vital information the United States government refused to reveal. It was this missing evidence that made any attempt to discover exactly what happened in Dallas an impossible task. The government's first investigation was conducted by the seven-member Warren Commission. They concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone to assassinate President Kennedy. But did the Warren Commission have access to all the facts it needed? Incredibly, the answer is no. Literally thousands of documents related to the assassination were hidden or censored by agencies like the CIA and FBI. They were never shown to the commission during its 18-month investigation. The CIA did not share information with them. The FBI was uh, cordial and helped to a certain extent, but uh, they were really left largely to do it on their own, and that's a huge task for any group in that short a period of time. In 1992, public pressure forced Congress to make one last attempt to learn the truth. They responded by creating the Assassination Records Review Board. The Cold War has ended. We've come into existence at a time when we could take advantage of some of these historical forces and work with the agencies to release these records. Appointed by President Clinton, their mandate was to locate and make public all records relevant to the killing of President Kennedy including documents from the largest keeper of assassination files, the CIA. Over the years, that agency has consistently refused to cooperate with investigators, 
and has covered up much of the information it has gathered. There were lies, there were distortions, there was a cover-up, there was obstruction of justice. There were withholdings of, of materials from congressional committees. Uh, many improper acts were, have been conducted uh, over the last 30 years. John Newman is a former intelligence officer, now a college professor. An expert on clandestine operations of the CIA and FBI, he has closely examined the secret reports and documents recently released by the review board. Files like this one, detailing highly confidential CIA methods and procedures. Records like this, detailing Lee Harvey Oswald's movements in Mexico City. And information contained in these boxes, simply referred to as Oswald's 201 file. Inside are pages of classified documents about his activity in the years leading up to the assassination. A 201 file for the CIA is an intelligence and counterintelligence file. Oswald had a 201 file. The problem was that all the things that should have been put into it were not. So, in a sense, Oswald's 201 file is more than a 201 file. It is a lens through which we can observe lots of anomalies about Oswald going on inside the CIA. For nearly 30 years, this CIA file has been kept secret by the agency. In 1997, the review board forced a release of most of its contents. The Warren Commission never saw this file. The Warren Commission didn't look at any of these CIA documents because one of the Warren Commissioners was Mr. Alan Dulles, who had been head of the CIA under John Kennedy, and uh, it was presumed that uh, he would uh, look into matters that needed to be looked into. So the CIA got uh, almost no uh, scrutiny whatsoever from the Warren Commission. In 1977, even when pressured by congressional investigators from the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the CIA again refused access to parts of Oswald's 201 file. They uh, sent a great number of administrative requests to the CIA for information about the 201 file and lists. Um, it is now clear that uh, in some instances the, the agency lied about the 201 file, about its contents, did not give the House Select Committee access to parts of the file that they knew existed and wanted to see. The information it contains not only confirms the government's very early interest in Oswald's activities, but discloses a startling revelation. Oswald was directly involved in sensitive intelligence operations for the CIA and probably for the FBI as well. My own guess is that a great many things that he becomes involved in with respect to the FBI and the CIA were benign. They were really legitimate intelligence operations. I'm not so certain that everything uh, falls into that uh, category, however, especially in Mexico City. These files show that six weeks before the president was murdered, Oswald turned up in Mexico City. The purpose of this trip was to obtain visas from the Soviet and Cuban embassies for a trip to Russia. It was a, an espionage world down there. The CIA was running many sensitive operations in Mexico. Um, those that are most crucial to uh, the story of uh, Oswald would be uh, centering on the Cuban consulate. Exactly what Oswald did in Mexico City, where he went and who he spoke with, has been difficult to establish until now. This piece of missing evidence written by two government investigators has been kept secret for nearly 20 years. In it are the secret details of his trip to Mexico City. In 1995, the review board ordered most of the report declassified, and what it revealed was startling. According to this document, the possibility exists that there was an Oswald imposter in Mexico, someone who looked like Oswald and may have been working for the CIA. I was stunned myself when I saw it the first time. Uh, even though it says it's a possibility, it, it's, it's, it's one hell of a possibility that somebody could be impersonating the, uh, the man who was going to be the, uh, the shooter of the president six weeks later. This is a photograph of the man claiming to be Lee Harvey Oswald. It was never seen by the Warren Commission. 
This series of photos was taken by a secret CIA surveillance camera hidden outside the Soviet embassy in Mexico City. Though this man does not even resemble Oswald, the CIA learned that he entered the embassy on numerous occasions using Oswald's name. But why would an Oswald imposter be in Mexico City? One intriguing possibility suggests that the impersonator was working as part of a plot to set up the real Oswald as the president's killer. Because the agency would have been forced to reveal its clandestine use of surveillance cameras to gather intelligence in Mexico, it chose instead to withhold these photographs, as well as additional information it knew about Oswald. The vast, vast majority of all the stuff we're looking at uh, had no business being withheld for sources and methods. Uh, ridiculous uh, it is now to, to look uh, gaze upon most of these documents and, and ask yourself, why on earth should this piece of paper have been withheld? But incredible as it may seem, the American public has had to wait 35 years to finally gain access to these documents. It's been devastating because we're talking, after all, about the murder of the President of the United States. And so any obstruction of uh, justice or investigation or any lie or deception um, has a much graver negative impact than the positive impact of protecting that particular asset. CIA and FBI documents alone will not answer all of the questions surrounding the killing of President Kennedy. Some of the answers may only come from new and unexpected sources, like this long-lost film shot in Dallas on the day of the assassination and kept secret for decades. Its existence was known only to a handful of individuals. What new evidence can be found among these grainy images? History Undercover will continue in a moment. We know they're out there. Individuals who ask more from a truck than 99% of the world. To us, they are the one percenters. With their demanding standards in mind, we introduce the all-new GMC Sierra. With our most powerful Vortec V8s ever, and the first available automatic four-wheel drive on a pickup. One percenters, step forward. The all-new Sierra from GMC. MCI five cents Sundays. Cut! Five. I need passion, depth. I need intensity. MCI five cents Sundays. Five cents a minute Cut! every Sunday. Think big. Think Shakespeare. Five cents a minute every Sunday. Five cents a minute every Sunday. I ask for an actor, they send a comedian. Call one eight hundred Sundays to become an MCI customer. Again. Call one eight hundred. For one of the richest sources of vitamins and minerals, people have come to Walgreens for nearly 100 years. Now, they can count on us for herbal supplements as well. Same high quality, new lower prices. Save $10 on glucosamine chondroitin, just $19.99 through November 28th at Walgreens. When you drink your morning coffee tomorrow, say thanks to the Pope who made it all possible. From the archives of the History Channel, this is Time Lab 2000. People began going crazy over coffee 600 years ago in the Middle East. The earliest coffee fanatics were Muslim mystics trying to stay awake for nighttime worship. Early coffee houses were such brewing grounds for radical ideas that authorities in Mecca tried to outlaw the drink. When coffee hit Europe in the late 1500s, priests at the Vatican labeled it an atheist concoction and wanted it banned there too. That's when Pope Clement VIII gave his blessing to the bean. This Satan's drink is so delicious, he is quoted as saying, we shall cheat Satan by baptizing it. Many of us have viewed coffee as a kind of holy water and wouldn't think of starting the morning or a new millennium without it. For the History Channel, I'm Sam Waterston. Sweet dream. 
between. We now continue with Missing Files, the JFK assassination. President Kennedy has been given a blood transfusion at Parkland Hospital here in Dallas in an effort to save his life. These are the images of an American nightmare. November 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy has just been shot. Spectators are frightened and dazed. These black and white images were some of the first pictures taken at the scene. The footage was shot by local Dallas news cameramen Roy Cooper and Don Cook. And for decades, the American people did not even know this film existed. In order to avoid publicity, the cameramen kept this footage a secret until 1996, when it was released to the public by the Assassination Review Board. I went to Dallas uh, under the premise that I had seen pictures from Dealey Plaza and there were literally thousands of people there who had cameras in their hand that day, thinking, where are all these pictures that were taken? Someone's got to have something in a shoebox, in a closet, that would be interesting and relevant. This film you are now seeing was kept hidden by Roy Cooper for more than 30 years and was uncovered by the review board. Cooper was covering the president's trip to Texas. The film was intended for use by a local television station. But most of these images never made it on the air. Amazingly, they were discarded by the station. Cooper rescued the film from the trash and spliced the pictures together. It was never shown to government investigators and most of it has never been seen before. Although there are no pictures of the actual assassination itself here, the film does include some very startling images. So much of this stuff that really almost looks like filler is, is just so important to the historic record because we don't have anything similar to it, you know, in, in, in other forms elsewhere. So it's just a, a remarkable film in that uh, it shows from so many different viewpoints things that were happening that fills in gaps uh, uh, concerning the uh, story of the assassination weekend. Investigator Richard Trask has spent the last 10 years studying the films and photographs of the Kennedy assassination. He relates the story of the film since it was recorded without sound. Uh, as a good reporter, photographer, what he did was he started running to where the scene of action apparently was. And what you do see is very brief clips of the scene behind the grassy knoll in the area to the side of the school book depository which was a parking area and railroad area and what you see is Cook taking pictures probably within two or three minutes after the assassination of people getting into that area kind of looking to see what's happening. The sequence is short but the pictures are extremely valuable in supporting conspiracy claims that gunshots may have been fired from more than one location. While some searched the area behind the grassy knoll, others said they distinctly heard shots coming from the school book depository. You can see police activity starting to center in and around the Texas school book depository building where reports had been given that uh, shots had been fired from. Uh, a call went out on all uh, police radios for all vehicles to report uh, code 3, emergency 2, uh, Elm and Houston Street, and you can see various of the cruises uh, arriving. Again, this is not in chronological order, but it's all within now about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Also caught on film during the confusion was a bystander named Larry Flora. He'd been looking for a telephone in the building next to the depository and was mistakenly thought to be a suspect. Apparently somebody there thought he was suspicious looking and as he was leaving the building uh, somebody tapped on a window and motioned to uh, one of the cops down below to stop that man and you can see in the film clip uh, two cops have uh, stopped Flora and although there's nothing that tells me this he looks like he's intoxicated he acts that way and they uh, asked him what he was doing there uh, they began questioning him decided they should bring him over to the sheriff's office, which was a short ways away. And as they were escorting him, a couple people uh, were uh, heard to hollow, why don't you kill the son of a bitch, and, and things like that. 
Trask estimates that hundreds, perhaps thousands of people photographed the events on November 22nd. But there is one image that escaped nearly everyone. Not until review board investigators carefully screened the Cooper film had anyone ever seen a moving picture of Lyndon Johnson as he left the hospital after learning President Kennedy was dead. When these pictures were taken, only a few people knew that the president had died from his gunshot wounds. Again, scenes from Parkland Hospital right after the assassination. And here we have Johnson being led by his Secret Service agent, Rufus Youngblood, and some of the congressional delegation going to an unmarked police car uh, driven by Chief Curry and being brought as quickly as possible back to the airport before the public is told that the president is dead. As Vice President Johnson prepares to leave for Washington, the search for the president's killer intensifies and pictures of grief and mourning are replaced by images of anger and fear. Who killed the president and was more than one person involved? According to Trask, the Cooper film helps debunk at least one conspiracy theory that Jack Ruby plotted with Lee Harvey Oswald to kill the president. What fueled the conspiracy theory is this still photograph taken outside the depository just minutes after the assassination by amateur photographer Phil Willis. There's a man who looks very much like Jack Ruby, balding, pudgy face, dark glasses, suit coat on. And many uh, conspirator uh, believers thought, well, if Ruby's in Dilly Plaza at the time of the assassination, there must be some linkage between Ruby and Oswald, or what's he doing there? From a different angle, that same man appears in the Cooper film. It's very hard to locate him. You can just, for a moment, slightly see uh, this man in the corner here what looks to be a Jack Ruby look-alike. By comparing times and locations with the Willis photograph, Trask was able to determine these were indeed pictures of the same man, but not of Jack Ruby. The picture tells the truth, but it doesn't always tell the full truth, so you have to be able to compare and contrast one picture to another. Uh, so this picture led me to, to believe that, that the uh, Willis uh, uh, picture, in fact, was not of uh, Jack Ruby. So I think that controversy can finally be put to rest. But Jack Ruby would make himself known to the world soon enough. Hours after the president's assassination, a disturbing moment was captured on the Cooper film. The image of Jack Ruby clearly present at the Dallas Police News Conference with Lee Harvey Oswald. This is... Uh, just before Oswald is brought into what's called the show-up room, where uh, the press conference, or actually the, the viewing of Oswald, was uh, made uh, around midnight, uh, the 22nd into the 23rd. This man right here, who's leaning over in front of the various other uh, press photographers, is Jack Ruby. He has no business being where he is. It remains a total mystery how Ruby gained access to the press briefing at police headquarters and why he was there. He later bragged to reporters that he was carrying a gun. Whether he intended to shoot Oswald that night or was planning Oswald's assassination, no one knows for certain. But as Ruby watched, Oswald proclaimed his innocence. What explanations had Oswald given to the police earlier that afternoon? And why was his interrogation stopped after only one hour of questioning? A revealing document, thought to have been lost for more than 30 years, may hold the answer to both those questions. History Undercover will continue in a moment. Italy. 
For years, Intel technicians have been making PCs smarter. Now, they face their greatest challenge ever. Hey, no one messes with my brain until I get sprinkles. <laughs> Suckers. Now, anyone can have all the brain power they want. Just look for a PC with an Intel processor inside. By eliminating covalence inhibitors, we create triple-dense carbohydrates and thus the so-called super donut. Ooh. Many of you mock my interest in the pastry sciences. What do you have inside? Covert operations, behind enemy lines, it's dirty work. It is the most sophisticated and most dangerous kind of a cat and mouse game in the world. These men do it for the challenge. They go in with finely honed techniques to gather intelligence and maximize firepower. Then get out fast. They are the Green Berets on the warrior tradition. Tomorrow at 9 Eastern, 10 Pacific on the History Channel. There are those who don't jump on the latest trends, who believe in a truck's agility and determination, who believe in a truck with legendary Vortec technology that handles even when fully loaded. For those who know when a truck is a truck and not just a bandwagon. Jump into your very own 98 Sonoma right now. Get $2,000 cash back or 0.9% APR financing. The Sonoma from GMC. We now continue with Missing Files, the JFK assassination. Today, at the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas, Texas, fascinated tourists view Lee Harvey Oswald's sniper's nest from behind a plexiglass barrier, a silent monument to a national tragedy. But on November 22, 1963, in this building once called the Texas School Book Depository, the sight of those boxes and that window triggered a moment which horrified the entire nation. This film of the Book Depository's sixth floor was shot in the first frantic minutes after the assassination by television news cameraman Tom Allier. Obtained by the Assassination Review Board in 1996, Allier's film contains the only pictures of the police investigation on the sixth floor. He took a 16 millimeter uh, camera, three extra reels of film, got out of the car and ran towards the book depository. Took some general views of what was happening and then was the only cameraman or even photographer who actually got into the book depository at a time before the police were doing a, a full-scale search. He was there for the next several hours because they sealed the building. As the search for Kennedy's assassin continued, police and Secret Service agents insisted that everyone leave the book depository, but they were too busy to enforce their orders. Tom Allier remained inside and kept taking pictures. He also took film of uh, evidence as it was being found on the sixth floor, including the finding of the Manlika Kakano rifle uh, that was Oswald's. And all the time he was trying to skirt around so that he wouldn't be thrown out, uh, trying to get available light with his camera so he'd be able to have something. And he just took a wonderful series of film. To get his film out of the building, Allier had to throw it to his partner, waiting below an open window. Some of the film was eventually broadcast on WFAA television news. Some of it was thrown away. Allier took the remaining pieces of footage, spliced them together, and then hid the film for more than 20 years. Allier saw that at WFAA, they were generating so much film uh, that the people who were uh, in the control area were saying, as soon as it's shown, next day, let's get rid of this because it's just accumulating. And he understood that this is raw history. Throughout the afternoon of November 22nd, as portions of Allier's film were being broadcast, the scene at police headquarters was total confusion. 
Reporters and photographers roamed the halls looking for information. An inner office of the homicide division was used as an interrogation room. It was there that the police and FBI had a chance to question their primary suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. Following standard FBI procedures, no stenographer or recording device was used. The only record of Oswald's interrogation were the handwritten notes taken by the FBI. These notes were thought to have been destroyed more than 30 years ago, but that never happened. In 1996, a book about the assassination was published that drew the review board's attention to its author, James Hostie. Hostie was the first FBI agent to interrogate Oswald on the afternoon of the assassination. My first impression of, of Lee Oswald was that he was very self-assured, very cocky. He uh, had a uh, demeanor that uh, he knew something that uh, he wasn't going to tell it, you know, and he was just going to play games with us. In 1963, Hostie worked as a special agent in counterintelligence for the FBI in Dallas. He was familiar with Lee Harvey Oswald and his pro-Soviet activities. Three hours after the president was shot, Hostie was summoned to police headquarters to question Oswald. I got to the police department. It, it was overrun by press. There were hundreds of people there. I, I recognized some of them, and I know they weren't in the news media, and they had no business being there. They were just uh, onlookers and were just uh, uh, gawkers, and it was uh, total chaos. Unknown to the Dallas police, Hostie had been informed of a trip Oswald had just made to Mexico. We had received a communication, a top secret communication from the CIA about a month before that uh, Lee Oswald had been in contact with the Soviets in Mexico City. Now I might add, this is important, that FBI headquarters neglected to tell me they knew, but they neglected to tell me that the man that Oswald was in contact with was the chief assassin for the uh, KGB for the Western Hemisphere. Why was Oswald in touch with a KGB agent named Valery Kostikov? Hostie knew he was on to something important. He was anxious to question Oswald further, but that was not to happen. The one time that he lost his cool at all was when I asked him about Mexico City. He immediately got startled and said, how did you know about that? And no, no, I know. I, 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 and, and, and then he started to deny it. Now, I think that was the one point. If we had been allowed to talk to uh, Oswald alone, I think we might have gotten to him at that point. Hostie's interrogation was abruptly cut short. Oswald's denial about traveling to Mexico City to contact the KGB was not pursued again. FBI superiors never allowed Hostie to complete his questioning. I was ordered out of the interrogation of Oswald and told not to tell the police department anything. That was the, in my opinion, was the first move of the, what I call a benign cover-up. Some speculate the FBI considered the Mexico City information too sensitive to be revealed to the public. They were concerned that Hostie's questions might compromise CIA operations. When asked by the Warren Commission in 1964 to produce his notes, Hostie told investigators he followed standard FBI guidelines and destroyed them. Somebody from the Warren Commission asked me, where are those notes? And I was kind of startled. I, uh, I'm, sp I'm supposed to, to uh, destroy them. And I said, well, I, I believe I destroyed them, which I, I think I, at that time I did believe I had destroyed them. Later, Hostie rediscovered his notes in a desk drawer. Unsure of their value, he held on to them for 34 years until the review board tracked him down. Less than 48 hours after Hostie's incomplete interrogation, Lee Harvey Oswald was dead. The mysteries of Oswald's life were further complicated by theories of conspiracy. Some say he could not have acted alone. That was the thinking of New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison who prosecuted a man named Clay Shaw, 
the only person ever tried for President Kennedy's murder. Records and testimony from that investigation were ordered destroyed. 20 years later, the review board found the one man who had stopped their destruction. We will return to History Undercover in a moment. Send your customers two-day packages with FedEx and we'll deliver, even on Saturdays, for an extra $10. Send your customers two- to three-day packages with priority mail and we'll deliver, even on Saturdays, at no extra charge. Send your customers two-day packages with UPS and we'll deliver. But not on Saturdays. Sorry. So, what's your priority? are still 560 years away. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. We will return in a moment to the people and events that shaped history on this day. Hi, I'm Gino, and this is my father, Luigi. And together, we own and operate Ristorante Agostino and Cocktail Bar in Capistrano Beach. We specialize in pasta, seafood, veal, and chicken. And if you're looking for Italian food like Mama used to make, come see Papa Luigi at Agostino. We're located in Capistrano Beach, one mile south of Dana Point Harbor on Pacific Coast Highway. If you're looking for Italian food like Mama used to make, come see Papa Luigi at Agostino's. Right, Dad? Yeah, what are you waiting for? Hi, I'm here with Bob and he's really cashing in. Bob called Cable Rep and is advertising his business on cable TV. You see, Bob optimizes his advertising budget with Cable Rep's affordable spots on popular, targeted cable networks. Bob knows that advertising on cable TV is a great investment, and it all adds up to more money in his pockets. Call Cable Rep Advertising. Put the power of cable TV to work for you. Hey, Bob, can I help you with that? We now continue with Missing Files, the JFK assassination. Almost immediately after the Warren Commission named Lee Harvey Oswald as the lone gunman in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, conspiracy theories began to circulate. One of the most tangled explanations for the assassination has its roots here in New Orleans. In 1967, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison began his own investigation into Kennedy's death. It ended with the trial of the only man ever tried for the president's murder. Garrison was certain the assassination resulted from a conspiracy involving the government and organized crime. Well, New Orleans, in many respects, is a sideshow to the assassination. It includes the only prosecution of anyone ever for the murder of President Kennedy, which was a New Orleans businessman named Clay Shaw, who was tried over 25 or so days and promptly acquitted by the jury. Garrison accused Clay Shaw of conspiring with Oswald to murder the president. The accusations made headlines. But some called Garrison a publicity seeker, believing that he was simply feeding on the growing sentiment that Oswald could not have acted alone. For four years, the Assassination Review Board fought to release classified evidence that could possibly reveal new information about the assassination. What they uncovered was a rare and remarkable assortment of previously unseen documents including these transcripts from the grand jury proceedings in the Shaw case. Transcripts like these are always kept secret. They were locked inside the district attorney's office until they were uncovered by this man, Gary Raymond. 
For seven years, beginning in 1974, Raymond was a special investigator for the city's district attorney, Harry Connick. Shortly after he took office, Connick ordered that hundreds of old files be destroyed. Defying orders, Raymond pried open a lock and found the Shaw grand jury transcripts. Once we jacked open that, that last file cabinet, I started thumbing through the contents, and there were some names that didn't mean anything to me. But I came across uh, the testimony of Marina Oswald, and I instantly knew that this was relevant to Garrison's investigation of Clay Shaw. It was like, wow, history. You know, history just hit me in the face. But District Attorney Connick was not happy with Raymond's discovery. He and Garrison were bitter political enemies. According to Raymond, Connick wanted none of Garrison's files left around the office, including the secret grand jury transcripts. He said, this is trash. This is junk. Uh, this, this whole investigation was nothing but the over, overactive imagination of Jim Garrison. He says, I want that crap out of this building, and I want it out of this building today. And with that, he walked out the grand jury door and slammed it. But instead of burning the files as he was ordered to do, Raymond packed them up in the trunk of his car and hid them for more than 20 years. My intention was to get the papers, get the documents to somebody who would take care of them and preserve them. 31 years after the trial, the transcripts arrived in Washington, where they were turned over to the review board and made public. Raymond was prosecuted and was found guilty of violating state secrecy laws. He is hoping to avoid jail time. If they want to put me in jail for, for doing what I thought was the moral, proper thing to do in light of the historical significance of these documents, then they can put me in jail. In 1997, another valuable document was discovered by the review board. Hidden among the 6,000 papers related to the prosecution of Clay Shaw was a 30-year-old diary. It contains the recollections of Tom Bethel, who worked as a researcher for Jim Garrison on the Shaw case. For 18 months, Bethel recorded confidential details about the trial, but later lost track of his diary. I haven't seen this document, which is a Xerox copy of the typescript of my diary. I have not seen it for nearly 30 years. For Tom Bethel, even time has not diminished the memories of Jim Garrison, a district attorney who, he says, was out of control. I think that um, he was, in some respects, crazy. I mean, I think that he probably believed what he was saying about there being a conspiracy. And um, I think he believed that Clay Shaw would ultimately never be brought to trial because the government is going to have to come in and kill him before he ever actually gets brought to trial. Bethel wrote about Garrison in his diary on September 14th, 1967. I remember once one Sunday when we were holding staff meetings in the middle of the day, he started to talk to the assembled lawyers about the paramilitary operation in Dealey Plaza. He got carried away and was talking about platoons of National Guardsmen hiding in churches, infantry movements, armored convoys moving through Dallas, underground canteen facilities in a huge dugout under Dealey Plaza, and so on. It was entertaining, it was amusing, but, you know, you have to realize also that real people were being charged, and uh, in the case of Clay Shaw, brought to trial and accused of committing the crime of the century. Shaw was arrested by the New Orleans police on March 1st, 1967. It would take more than three decades for missing evidence related to his trial to mysteriously reappear. After Shaw's death in 1974, a person wishing to remain anonymous gave his personal papers to the review board, 23 boxes containing photographs, business records, passports, and most revealing of all, Clay Shaw's typed diary. And so it begins. This journal, which is to be a record of the most horrifying, unbelievable, nightmarish experience through which I have ever lived. March the 1st will be certainly the great day in my life. 
for it was on March 1st that I was arrested for conspiring with others to murder the president, John F. Kennedy. For Clay Shaw, the nightmare had only just begun. It is important that I try to set down for myself and possibly others the Kafka S. Hall, which began on this date. Bethel and others believed Garrison's case against Shaw was flawed from the beginning. They were able to get witnesses because they had potential drug charges against them. So rather than be prosecuted and thrown into the awful New Orleans prison, some of these people were prepared to come up with statements to help Garrison's investigation. And that's basically what was going on. On March 15, 1968, Bethel wrote in his diary. It now looks as though there is no alternative to the clear-cut conclusion that Clay Shaw is completely innocent. Now, I could see that, and I think, frankly, just about everybody in the office could see it. But Jim Garrison, I really think, could not see it, because his mind was so befuddled by his belief in his own mad theories. After 40 days of testimony, it took a jury less than one hour to acquit Clay Shaw of conspiracy to kill the president. Jim Garrison considered the verdict unjust. Garrison's successor, District Attorney Harry Connick Sr., believed his theories were groundless. He reportedly ignored subpoenas and refused to release files related to the Shaw case. Finally, a Supreme Court decision forced Connick to turn over all the documents. In the spring of 1998, the review board flew to New Orleans to recover the files related to Garrison's investigation. Well, I think it was the correct decision. I think the board does have the authority to uh, obtain this type of information. Uh, it's directly related to the assassination. No one uh, disputes that. Uh, so I think it was the correct decision, and uh, uh, everyone has recognized it now, and the information's being released. But what about other material that the review board has not been able to declassify or release? When we return, the story of one man's refusal to turn over his home movie of the presidential motorcade filmed from the car right behind Kennedy's limousine. History Undercover will continue in a moment. Sometimes the best way to say something is to simply show it with a color photo. Canon Color Scanners. Just click, scan, add your personal photos to anything and print in beautiful color. It's easy. <laughs> Starting around $79, the Cano Scan Flatbed Color Scanners. Only from Canon. Where I come from, things are like in the big leagues. Full of excitement. Enjoy the Dominican Republic. Mi casa es su casa. The Dominican Republic. Come and share our treasures. Large cheese. Somebody order a pizza? Oh, I guess it's a pretty typical dorm room. Stuff's constantly going on. Hey, dude, can I borrow some underwear? We party. What's up? We study. Can I borrow some socks? No. We eat. Somebody order a pizza? So it's not like I have a ton of time or money to shop for a car. But I heard some pretty good things about Saturn, and I figured I'd check out their website. It was definitely different. I mean, I could actually pick out a car, play around with options, figure out monthly payments, avoid a lot of hassles. I'll put some deodorant. And Brian, my sales consultant, treated me great. Looking at the coupe? Which was also pretty different. That was not all. Do it again. Considering the first time we actually met was when he stopped by with my coupe. I am here with the Saturn. Somebody order a Saturn. Modern marvels. There's so much you can do with a prosthesis nowadays. Run a race, drive a car, take a swing, or ride a bike. Electronic hands that grab, limbs that sense and feel. 
the next generation in a legacy of innovation. From iron rims to high-tech plastics, the long journey to state-of-the-art replacement parts. Prosthetics, tomorrow at 10 Eastern, 11 Pacific, on an all-new Modern Marvels. We now continue with Missing Files, the JFK assassination. In the aftermath of President John F. Kennedy's assassination, Americans found themselves with few answers. His death could not have happened under more mysterious and puzzling circumstances. With so much misinformation, deception, and missing evidence, will we ever find the truth? One key piece of information relating to Kennedy's death is a film that very few people even know exists. It is a home movie filmed from the car in the motorcade right behind the president's limousine. The film was shot by this man, Kennedy's close friend and presidential aide, Dave Powers. Minutes before the assassination, Powers was taking home movies from the Secret Service car in the presidential motorcade. Although asked by the review board to make his film permanently available, Powers declined. He believed that his film was his own personal property that he had taken. And I think being a personal friend of the president's, he didn't want to give up something that was so valuable to himself. When Powers died in 1998, he left instructions that the film not be released to the public. The American public deserved to know the information that's hidden in the shoeboxes, hidden in dusty old files. Uh, it's time to share that information with the public. Uncovering all the government's classified information was the mandate of the Assassination Records Review Board. But the board's term expired in September 1998, and with its offices now closed, we may never see this film, and the information it could reveal may never be known. Well, I think history will, will look at the review board uh, as a group that had a, a limited purpose and a focus and came in and worked very hard and got that done. Certainly, uh, whether the review board's information that's shared with the American public changes the way anyone looks at the assassination is an open question, and I wouldn't pretend to try to answer that. With access to half a million classified pages that the board has released, researchers are now beginning to find answers to questions that have confounded the public for decades, including a question most often asked, did the assassination involve a CIA-backed conspiracy? I think the idea of a high-level institutional plot in the, within the CIA to kill John Kennedy is crazy. On the other hand, somebody lower down in the organization who knew what a sensitive file we were talking about here with Oswald could have looked at him as a perfect patsy. So um, we are n nowhere near out of the woods where we could theorize that some low-level agency people might have been involved. The Kennedy assassination it is like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle for which we have a hundred thousand pieces. And the problem is to find out, to winnow away the irrelevant pieces that don't really belong there. But still, the question remains what is the American public to conclude about Kennedy's assassination? The public has always wanted to believe that. It's got to be a big conspiracy that puts down our president. It can't be a little nobody who did that. Because if a little, if a little nobody can, can change the course of American history, what does that mean about us and, and our place in the world? It means that the world is really a more scary place than most of us want to believe. In my opinion, we will know who killed John Kennedy, but it's not going to be for a while. The answers will be in the archives, 90%, but there's, there's going to be a certain set of questions and answers that are going to turn up in the shoebox or underneath the house or, or in the attic. Um, it's not going to just be in, in government files. Will we ever get all the answers to the Kennedy assassination? Absolutely not. Good information, lousy information, truths half-truths, lies, innuendos. It's very hard to really go through that entire logjam of material to come up with anything that really approaches 
the truth to all of the questions. Finding the truth may not be easy, but the simple democratic principles of openness and accountability demand that we try. I think hopefully we have taught government and perhaps American people too that uh, information can be shared, that the Republic will survive and may even be strengthened through sharing information about actions of government officials. This is a sad time for all people. After more than three frustrating decades of unanswered questions, the search for clues to one of the most perplexing mysteries of the modern era may have only just begun. The Assassination Records Review Board put more than four million pages of documents in the public domain. The material is available to read at the National Archives. Some sections containing secret information are blacked out, but all the records will be fully disclosed by the year 2017. So far, the information has changed very few minds. People who feel Oswald acted alone and those who believe in a conspiracy both claim the new evidence is on their side. The debate continues. For the History Channel, I'm Arthur Kent. Thanks for watching. I'm Arthur Kent. That's it for Guts and Glory Sunday on the History Channel. Join me next week as we take a look at the guns of the Civil War on Tales of the Gun. Then the incredible story behind the betrayal of Hitler's master spies on Sworn to Secrecy. And on History Undercover, we'll explore how close Hitler could have come to bombing Washington, D.C. See you next week on the History Channel.